So what happened in 2022? Well, it was an amazing year in the energy transition. The first year that the planet spent more than a trillion dollars on the energy transition. We are using less gas for generation every year. Renewables are coming up. Victoria is greening up now 40% renewables. Won't be long before they cross over and renewables become a greater part of the grid than coal. I think we'll start to see it happen. Well, we actually had one day last year, 21st of November was the very first time, at least in our lifetimes, where renewables generated more power or more energy into uh, the grid than coal on that day. So just one day last year, pretty soon it'll be a week, then a month, and then it'll be full time. Yeah, hopefully in a decade or so, we'll turn off the last coal power generator. So quick reminder of why we're here. This is CO2 levels for the last 800,000 years. Humans arrived around about here. We learned about burning coal right around here. We've already increased a full degree. And if we don't start reversing the trend, it will keep going up. I'm haunted by this quote. Winning slowly is the same as losing. A bit sobering because I focus on all the little wins that we're making, but I have to acknowledge that to date, we're not winning fast enough. So what do we have to do? We have to replace fossil fuels. What do we replace them with? So Griffith put it very succinctly, we need to electrify everything. And we electrify everything with renewables and those things that we can't electrify, like perhaps making steel or making fertilizer, we make green hydrogen. Once again, we're lucky with all the critical minerals, whether it's nickel or rare earths or cobalt, Australia has the critical minerals. We have everything that is going to be needed for the new revolution in the next industrial revolution, which is to decarbonize our planet's systems. So Australia should see this as an opportunity, not as a threat. And I think there are signs that that is starting to cut through. The first year that the planet spent more than a trillion dollars on the energy transition. Over a trillion dollars was invested. Where did that go? About half of it, 500 billion was on renewable energy. Just under 500 billion was on transport, mainly electric vehicles and electric buses. A growing amount on energy storage. Hydrogen is the fastest growing, but off a very low base. It's still very early days for green hydrogen. So wind and solar are the majority of what's going on in the renewable space. And solar from a slower start than wind is now growing most rapidly of all. And you can see that this growth trajectory, the amount of renewables we're installing every year is exponential. Back to Australia, I've got three lines here. Our coal percentage in the grid, turquoise, is renewables, gas is uh, the orange color here. So you can see as renewables have gone up, contrary to a lot of commentators claims, gas hasn't gone up in parallel. In fact, the December quarter finished was the lowest gas usage since I think 2004 or 2005. We are using less gas for generation every year. In the last 10 years, we've had solar grow by 1,345% in our network up 28 terawatt hours, which is kind of like four or five good sized coal power generators. And you see gas and mainly coal have been pushed out. Very exciting to see that process of solar and the wind going in and the coal and the gas coming out. It's important at this point to remind that emissions are not just the electricity sector. Electricity is only about 30% of our emissions. Yes, we're doing a great job in electricity and yes, it's really important, especially as we electrify everything, we depend on low emissions from the electricity sector, but we don't have good strategies in these other sections. Great thing is once we stop using fossil fuels, this fugitive sector just disappears. I just want to talk briefly about my theory of change and that's systemic change. And I think that starts with advocacy. Together we are shaping public opinion Public opinion changes the politics and changes the political will. And we definitely saw that last May. That political will translates into policy, policy into investment. Investment, one's doing a lot of heavy lifting here. Innovation, the costs come down, we create jobs and we have success, we get outcomes. That gives us more confidence that we can achieve. And it gives us more imagination that we can see a future that may have seemed completely out of reach not long ago is, is within reach. And that gives us the confidence to advocate again. And I see this as a virtuous circle that we're all engaged with. I want to give you some good news on electric vehicles. A decade ago, close to zero. 
Now 10 million EVs were sold last year. Peak car was 2017. Who would have thought there'd be a point when car sales peaked? The only part of the car market that's growing significantly is the electric part. Exciting figures, 13% of cars sold globally last year were electric, 49% of buses, basically half of the buses sold in the world. And that's because in China, it's pretty much 100% of buses are being sold as electric and massive retrofits to the legacy fleet as well. How about Australia? Well, we are lagging. Everyone knows we're lagging on EVs and it's because we've had no policy, because we have policy settings that protect the car industry that closed down five, six, seven years ago. But we do have significant growth. Last year, 3.8% of cars in Australia were EVs, nearly double the previous year. The emissions of a petrol car over its lifetime obviously depends which country you're in. I looked it up and Australia's grid is somewhere between Poland and Germany, but even at that level, an EV has half the emissions per kilometre. And the good thing is it gets cleaner every year because every year our grid decarbonises. I saw this in, in December. This is a blade going off to be tested, the largest wind turbine to be made. It is 115 metres long and it's going on a 15 megawatt wind turbine. So I was blown away by this. And then the next month in January, the Chinese of course had to outdo. This is 140 metres and it's going for an 18 megawatt uh, wind turbine. The previous one I showed you, this one will generate enough power for 20,000 homes. The technology change is phenomenal. So these are designed for offshore use. If you'd asked me five years ago, what about offshore wind in Australia? I'd say, well, it's too expensive and we don't have much shallow water. Well, this is a floating wind farm. They believe that all the infrastructure connecting it will work fine in waters up to 800 metres deep. So it'll work anywhere around Australia. But what's interesting about this, this project just celebrated its fifth year of operation. This is not new technology being tested. It's five years and last year it was the best performing offshore wind farm in the world because it's out in the deeper water with better wind. Geeks have gone from saying we'll probably never have offshore wind in Australia to actually there being a whole lot of companies looking at offshore wind and starting to peg out where it would be interesting. The zones that are under investigation, the Hunter Valley, Illawarra, Gippsland, Northern Tasmania, Portland, uh, Bunbury and Perth are the offshore zones of, of interest. And Gippsland is the first to be officially designated as such. This nondescript facility Tesla built it can crank out batteries like those ones I showed you, each of these little container ones here. I did a quick calculation. A factory of this size could, in a year, produce as much batteries as Australia is going to need over the next decade. Yeah, the question is, why are we not setting up these kind of factories in Australia and supplying all of Australia, but also our neighbours nearby? Back to big opportunities, big wind, big EV, big storage, big opportunities. Critical minerals. If there was a creator, then the creator tripped over and spilt the periodic table all over Australia. We've got everything. We've got rare earth minerals, we've got nickel, we've got bauxite, we've got iron ore, we've got all the critical minerals that are needed for the energy transition. Just a reminder of the kind of projects that people are talking about. This is a huge project. That's to scale on the map. It's a big project, but it would be the biggest generator in the world, bigger than the Three Gorges Dam in China, bigger than the Otapu Dam in, in Brazil. And it would be a combination of wind and solar. And its intention is that it would produce a large amount of green hydrogen, which would be used for fertilizer production and export in ammonia form and green steel production. Here's the hybrid plant in Sweden. Volvo produced this mining vehicle using steel from that plant. It's completely fine steel, it works, but it's also fossil free and it's here now. Now this is a relatively small plant, but what's really exciting is this is happening in Sweden. It's a bit of a shame it's not happening here, but we have so many advantages. We have access to much cheaper energy they do to make the green hydrogen that goes into making the steel. We have access to the iron ore. We have everything that they have, except I guess they had a political system that committed to this R&D a decade ago while we were twiddling our thumbs. I hope that we can get on and do projects like this. So back to Bill McKibben. Winning slowly is the same as losing. Yep, he's absolutely right. 
we are winning slowly, but I want to make the point that we are accelerating and that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. This is predictions from the energy market operators rapid transformation scenario in 2015. So this is a rapid transition scenario from 2015, just seven years ago. This is what they released last year. This is renewables. So we've gone off that trajectory to this one and they now see a significant role for storage. I believe this is absolutely possible. And now I've seen that Tesla battery factory, uh, I do too. Some of you have seen this slide before. This is New York Fifth Avenue in 1900. There's one car in this photo. Where's the car? There's one car in there. 13 years later, where's the horse? There's one horse there, the rest are cars. In 13 years, a hell of a lot can happen. And I showed you how much is happening in the last seven or eight years. Imagine another six or seven years from now, we are starting to win. Uh, well, we are winning and we're starting to win faster and we're accelerating. And I'll just leave this up while I do questions where hopefully people can think about what I think is this virtuous circle, all the different places that you can put yourself to help accelerate this virtuous circle. Thank you very much.